Joining us now on the line from New York, New York, David Schenk. He is the author of The Genius in All of Us, Why Everything You've Been Told About Genetics, Talent, and IQ is Wrong. And with that nice provocative title, I welcome you to the program. And I wonder, David, if we could just start with a handy-dandy definition. What is epigenetics? What is epigenetics? Well, epigenetics, or gene expression, is a, a new wrinkle, actually, in our understanding of genes. N relatively new to scientists, brand new to to the public for sure. And that is, it's this understanding that genes actually are not so much like our old understanding of a blueprint that transmit information directly into uh, proteins and then straight to traits, but actually are more in, involved in a dynamic, an interactive dynamic with signals coming from the outside, from the environment, meaning uh, our literal environment, also the environment outside of cells. So. Uh, epigenetics is this idea that information and signals comes from outside the gene, literally epi is outside, outside the gene, to affect how our genes end up uh, telling us who we're going to be and, and building our life for us. And what does epigenetics have to weigh in on on the issue of nature versus nurture? Well, epigenetics and genetic expression really fundamentally changes the whole idea of nature versus nurture. For, for one thing, it, it, really gets, it really argues against that phrase. Even the idea that there is a distinct nature and a distinct nurture starts to go away when you think about genes being more interactive with the environment. So in other words, you could have exactly the same quote unquote gene for eye color that I might have. And in our old understanding, of course, those two genes would, would lead to exactly the same eye color. But with our new understanding of gene expression or epigenetics, we're actually not entirely certain, uh, just looking at the gene, what the end result trait is going to be. And that's an unknowable fact until you see what the dynamic is in each person. So you and I can have the same gene for a trait, but the end, but the end trait is actually going to be different depending on that interaction between gene and the environment. Okay, in which case, if we live in a world of epigenetics now, if nature versus nurture is not the right debate to have, what's a better phrase to sum up where the debate should be? Well, there's several different ways to put it. Um, I mean, one, one way to, to start thinking about this is to try to replace the, uh, the model that's in our minds, the, the metaphor that's in our minds. I, I like to think of getting rid of the old blueprint model. So if you think of your mind, in your mind of, of a blueprint, which is really how uh, scientists have most commonly explained genes to us, right? Genes have this information, this very specific information uh, and, and that information can be uh, analogized to a blueprint of how a trait is going to be in the end result. So you've got genes that are, that are going to actually give instructions on how tall you're going to be, on how muscular you're going to be, on how musical you're going to be, on how intelligent you're going to be. All these different end result traits are actually buried in information, specific information in your genes. That's the old model. So the new way to think about genes is actually that they're more like switches that get turned on and off. So I think of it more as a mixing board. If you think of like a giant mixing board in a sound studio or a studio like, like the one you have, I'm sure, uh, where genes are more like knobs and switches constantly getting turned on and off and up and down depending on the other genes that are surrounding them and also on these environmental signals that we al already talked about. So you can't absolutely be sure what the genetic effects are going to be until you put them in a certain environment. Hmm. Some of the stuff I've read about this suggests that your work is in some respects challenging the conventional wisdom that Charles Darwin put forward as you know 150 years ago and to that end I want to read an excerpt of a piece that you no doubt saw a year ago in Time magazine on this and it goes like this any such effects of nurture environment on a species nature genes were not supposed to happen so quickly Charles Darwin taught us that evolutionary changes take place over many generations and through millions of years of natural selection but Bygren and other scientists have now amassed historical evidence suggesting that powerful environmental conditions, near death from starvation for instance, can somehow leave an imprint on the genetic material in eggs and sperm. These genetic imprints can short circuit evolution and pass along new traits in a single generation. Does this mean that Darwin, David, is, you know, is no longer the guru of scientists out there on this <laughs> file? Okay, well, a couple of points. First of all, it's not me taking on Darwin or taking on anyone else. I'm just, you know, I'm not a scientist myself. I'm just reading, reading the science. You're the conduit. We get the that. Public. So, so let's, let's be clear about that. I don't want to see the Shank versus Darwin headline <laughs> up there somewhere. 
Um, the, the second point to make is, um, yes, um, epigenetics and, and genetic expression does change our understanding of natural selection and what the public thinks of as Darwinism. And, and my book does reflect the beginning of an understanding of scientists, and this is fairly new, uh, uh, to, to try to kind of think this through and do more studies. We really don't know, uh, we really don't know how far it's going to go and how, how radically it's going to change our conception of evolution, but for sure it's going to, uh, the, the, the model is going to adapt and our understanding is going gonna, is gonna to shift somewhat. Now what we haven't said on the program yet that's crucial to this conversation is that not only uh, do we have a situation where individuals are developing with this G, GXE, this kind of gene interacting with environmental, environment model, but it's also true that in, in epigenetics, some of those changes to the epigenome, the information around kind of surrounding the genes, will actually then be uh, inherited from father or mother to son or daughter. That is, some of the environmental stimuli that we are going through before we have kids ends up changing the information surrounding our genes, and then we in turn pass that on. So that does become a new evolutionary uh, mechanism for sure. Now that is fascinating. Let me follow up on that because the example they used in Time Magazine was, uh, for example, in a Scandinavian country many years ago, and the issue was starvation. How is it possible, you've got to explain this to us, how an environmental condition such as you or I starving could somehow leave a genetic imprint on unborn offspring? How does that happen? It is, it is a mind blower because all of us are trained to think in Mendelian terms. Mendel was the kind of famous first geneticist who discovered the, 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 the gene model. And what we all have been brought up to think is that, again, genes have this information which translate directly to traits. And that, of course, famously, the gene itself cannot be changed. Now, that part is still true. Our genes do get passed on unchanged from parent to child. What we're learning now is that there is actually information that surrounds the gene. It's the epigenome. So think of a gene as being wrapped up in, a, in an in envelope, in, in, in a package that then is getting passed on. The genes themselves are not changing from me to my child, but the epigenome, it turns out, can be changed by my, uh, by my life experience, by my interaction with my environment. And of course, this would have to, have to happen before I have kids, but, but my epigenome ca can change as a result of my interaction with the environment, starving, smoking, uh, theoretically anything in my life could impact the information in my epigenome, that package, that wrapping around the gene, which I can then pass on to my kids. So their genetic information will be different from mine, even though their genes, the actual DNA itself, is unchanged. So if I lived in a country that for a lengthy period of time was very poor and went through a bad crop yield, and as a result the citizens of that country, you know, not starved to death, but were constantly malnourished and undernourished, how, how, would, how would that have an impact in terms of a genetic imprint on an unborn offspring that I have yet to have? Um, well, you actually don't have to make it nearly that extreme. We have all, all sorts of other experiments now with, with mice and, and, uh, and other living things that are showing. In, in mice, for example, we have uh, scientists, I should say we, the, the scientific community, I'll throw myself in there, have, have now seen that uh, nutrition and, in fact, behavior can change, again, those information signals that is... Uh, on a molecular level is, is kind of wrapped around that genetic information and is involved in gene expression, this process of the genes interacting with the environment, with the environment to determine our traits. So I can't really get any more specific than that no, to explain I, how I, that happens. I understand but that. But the information... To, I, I get you. Just sorry, tell me sorry, this, though. So does it mean that if, if I've gone through a particular period where I'm malnourished and, and have found myself starving on occasion, that will adversely affect the health, then, of my unborn offspring? It may. It may. I mean, that's what that one study suggested, and we've seen other studies to suggest that all sorts of other behaviors and life experiences also could have epigenetic changes, which will then get, uh, potentially get passed on to children. But this is the very beginning of this science, so we really don't know how far that reaches in terms of the epigenetic inheritance. Understood. Is the epigenetic change permanent? 
Um, well, again, there, there's, it's, some can be, uh, permanent is a, is a big word. So <laughs> we don't know permanence, but we do know that, uh, you know, what, that there are basically two kinds of epigenetics. We're talking about, on the one hand, gene expression. So in my life, from the moment I was conceived, we know that the information, uh, the signals passed from my genes to the, the protein building, which ends up making who I am and my brain and everything about my personality and all of my abilities, that is definitely impacted by, uh, by environment, by this interaction between genes and the environment. Now, some of that stuff, as we just talked about, uh, will then also become encoded in this epigenome, which I then pass on to my kids. So will then my, my son or daughter pass that information on to his uh, or her son or daughter? We have seen that, yes, it can pass on several generations and theoretically it could pass on forever, but then of course that could also be undone by things that we don't yet mm -hmm. know about. Sure, and, and one other wrinkle on this. We're, t we're talking now about incidents that say take place in our lives as adults. How far back in time could you go in order to have that kind of genetic impact on your offspring? In other words, if I did something incredibly stupid as a teenager, could that have genetic implications for offspring, which in this case obviously would be many years down the road? Um, I'd have to, uh, I think the theoretical answer to that is now uh, unambiguously yes. The practical answer to that is we just don't know. It's going to take many, many more years of science to see, you know, what sort of behaviors, what sort of uh, environmental stimulus, what sort of nutritional uh, experience, et cetera, emotional experience, it could be even intellectual experience. Any of these things theoretically could have epigenetic uh, epigenetic impacts, which then do get passed on to future generations. Okay, let me read one more excerpt for you. This one's from the bell curve back in 1994, very controversial as it was uh, back then. Uh, here's the quote. The irony is that as America equalizes the circumstances of people's lives, the remaining differences in intelligence are increasingly determined by difference in genes. Putting it all together, success and failure in the American economy and all that goes with it are increasingly a matter of the genes people inherit. Uh, how successful or how accurate, I guess, a picture of success and failure do you think that statement is all these years later? Well, I think that at the time that they wrote that, that was really their best understanding of genetic science. That really turns out to be fundamentally wrong. Yeah. We cannot now fundamentally talk about good genes or bad genes, genes for good intelligence, genes for bad intelligence. First of all, when the more complex the trait, and we all know that that intelligence is a very complex trait indeed and that we each have a number of different sorts of intelligence. So the more complex the trait, of course, the more you know, complex the mix is going to be. But fundamentally, what we now know about genes and genetic, and, uh, genetic expression is that it's, it's fundamentally a developmental concern. That is, the gene you have is not going to determine your intelligence. It's the gene and the genes, I should say, in in a, in a interactive dynamic with the life you lead, with the environment around you, and in fact inside you. So everything that we do as individuals, from the moment that we're first conceived to the moment that we die, is going to impact actually what our genes say to our bodies and how they build who we are. So we're all creatures of development. Well, let me follow up with a sports example because again, in one of the pieces I read, they talked about Ted Williams who was the greatest hitter who ever lived, for those who don't know, played for the Boston Red Sox for a lot of years, and, and it, you know, is widely believed to be the best ever at doing the hardest thing there is to do in sports, which namely is to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball coming right at your head. They always used to say about Ted that the guy was a born hitter. It must have been in right. his DNA for him to be this good at the hardest thing there is. But I right. guess what this evidence uh, or these studies indicate is that's just not the case. Is that right? It is right. In fact, I start my book with the story of Ted Williams. So thanks for giving me that softball. As Anytime. It were, to stay with the metaphor. They were all hardballs no, with Ted. No softballs for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, in fact, the interesting thing about that story is that Ted himself did not think that he was born with any special GNA, DNA. He, he thought of it as a, as a process. And only uh, the people who were close to Ted and saw him from age four and five and saw the extraordinary things he went through not just up until he became a professional baseball player, but even after that, uh, saw that it was very much a developmental process. So what I'm arguing in my book, taking you know, bits and pieces from the best science that I can see, is that we actually need to get rid of the idea of natural born, 
of giftedness, of innateness. And it's not, I'm not at all arguing that genes don't have an impact on this, and obviously we're all different genetically, and that is going to influence who we are. There's no question about that. But what those actual differences turn out to be, what our actual traits, what our actual talents, what our actual intelligences turn out to be, depends very much on that developmental dynamic, which involves both genes and the environment. So get rid of this notion that somehow some kids are born mediocre and cannot achieve academically, right? Absolutely, that, that notion needs to be, what we, what the, real, the real answer here is we don't know what an individual's potential is unless and until we apply extraordinary research, resources. That's what biology is now telling us. Fascinating stuff. David Shank, author of The Genius in All of Us, uh, it's awfully good of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Thanks very much, David. My pleasure, thanks for having me.